We have come to our last, but certainly not least, speaker of the day, Emma Towson. I'm really looking forward to your talk, Emma, uh, which is on lessons from Antarctica, women in STEM changing the narrative of leadership. And Emma is an assistant professor at the University of Calgary. Her interest in the emerging, emerging field of network neuroscience. She has a master's in mathematics and physics from the University of Warwick and received her PhD from the University of Cambridge. And Emma looks like you are all set and looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Catherine. And thank you everyone for organizing and inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. I've been really sad since NetSci got canceled at the in-person event. So it's really great to see you all here today. Yeah, so I'm gonna end today on something very, very different. I'm gonna talk to you about Antarctica. And as Catherine already told you, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary, although right now I'm still stuck in Boston. And I'm a network neuroscientist, so I use ideas from network science and graph theory to understand the brain in various organisms. You're looking at the worm and the mouse in those two pictures on the left. I'm also an educator on the right. You can see uh, me in a field with some students in Mexico. And this is us trying to use drones to teach them about spreading on networks. I'm also a uh, marathon runner and this was me as I was about to run six hours through a forest in Connecticut to see how far you can go. It was muddy and delightful and me at an authentic self. I'm also a sister, a daughter and a wife and a cat guardian of three complete pains but beautiful cats. <laughs> So for me, this saga starts back in 2019, which feels a lot longer ago than it did a few months ago. And like I said, I do a lot of running and I spend a lot of time on the treadmill, especially training for these events. And it's always like there's a TV on in the background saying California is on fire, or Australia is on fire, there's a hurricane coming here, this constant backdrop while you're doing the exercise. Then I'd leave and I'd try and go home. And in the car, the radio would come on and it's deforestation in Brazil. There's droughts in India and floods in Vietnam. Again, just this constant backdrop to life. And it's filling me with this unease and restless that I need to do something about this. And you feel very small. I really love this quote from the US advisor of climate change. Um, and sorry, I can't move my video out of the way, so I can't read it out to you. So I'll have to ask you to read it out for you read out for yourselves but the point here is we have the science of everything that's happening in the world now the ecosystem collapse and climate change we understand it and we know what to do that's not the problem the problem is we can't make people do it the problem is politics and corralling people and this is the the only thing that gave me hope here is also my discipline we're a complex systems advocates here we believe in complex system science and what we're seeing is a revolution in social networks. And this is what gives me hope here. These young people, these really uh, inspiring people in this picture, Greta Thunberg, Malala, and the Parkland victims, they're standing up and they're creating huge movements, the likes that we have never seen before. They're mobilizing people. And this is because there's a society primed for this now. We're all getting restless. We know we need to do something. And these big, these big waves of change are coming that people are able to inspire. And how do we do that as scientists? How do we get our voices out there? And it's while I'm in this frame of mind that I came across Homeward Bound. And Homeward Bound is a quite unique leadership program for women in STEM that I'll tell you about. And what I'd like to do in this talk is tell you about Homeward Bound, and especially for any women on the call, it will still be running for several more years yet, so please do consider applying. I'd like to give you some tools that you can take away for your own lives as well as your classrooms. And I want to inspire and urge you to act and start to practice a compassion and authentic way of leading and being. And of course, I want to show you some cute penguins because who goes to Antarctica and doesn't bring back pictures of cute penguins? So Homeward Bound describes itself as a groundbreaking global leadership initiative set against the backdrop of Antarctica, which aims to heighten the influence and impact of women in decision making in decisions that shape our planet. There's a 10 year vision to create a thousand person strong global network of women scientists who practice this new kind of leadership in the name of the greater good, not for themselves. 
Everyone in this program spans a huge variety of disciplines, countries and career stages, ages. I'll show you some examples in a moment. And every year there's about 100 new women recruited through, an, uh, through a competitive application process. The people that are selected go through a year of remote training. So for a year, we did three to five hours per week. We'd have a big call um, and twice to count to make up for time zones. And it was just really inspiring to be on a call with 80 people from all across the world today. And then finally, at the end of this, there's about a month of intensive in-person training in Antarctica and Ushuaia. The big streams of the program are visibility, how to heighten your own visibility and make use of it for a collective good, communication, strategy, and science. So these are just some of the amazing women I've had the privilege to work with. Um, Hinamoa is a Maori native and she works in brain research and especially with young children. Christina from the World Bank. Evgenia, she's a traveling scientist and does a lot of science communication writing um, nature opinion pieces and just travels around the world doing this. Um, Deb's a trauma surgeon in Texas. Karen works for an oil company, so she's very well poised to make a difference in a very different way to the kinds that we might be thinking about. And of course, this is focused on women in science. I'm going to talk a little less about this, but this is a constant backdrop to this leadership program. It's this kind of leadership that's being practiced is not just for women. I encourage all genders and men to take part and behave this way. These are just a behaviors that are more associated with women that um, we are supposedly better at. And B, women are not men. There are so many leadership programs that are telling us to just to be more confident, act this way. But what works for a man does not necessarily work for a woman. And we need to think about different ways to approach this. Like one example on here, um, success makes women less likable. So how are we supposed to handle this? So we did all this training for a year remotely. And really, this was just a build up to the really intensive period in Ushuaia and Antarctica. And like I said here, we fell off the end of the world. On that picture, you can see both Chile and Argentina as we just sail off the end of the world. And Antarctica is just breathtaking. Antarctica is like you have fallen off the end of the world into this snow globe that every day it shakes and it creates something completely different and equally as majestic as the day before. Historically, women were excluded from Antarctica, so it was deeply symbolic for us to head here. Can you believe this? <laughs> there are some things women don't do. They don't become Pope or President or go down to the Antarctic. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Henry Darlington, uh, Harry Darlington, um, ironically, his wife was one of the two first women to overwinter in Antarctica. Women will not be allowed in the Antarctic until we can provide one woman for every man. This is crazy. And there are still signs of this there when we enter um, the British research stations, we can still see signs of this uh, very pervasive misogyny that it's everywhere in science, but in polar science, it seems to be quite uh, archaic. So we haven't progressed so much. And we went on the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Antarctic Treaty. So this is even more symbolic for us. We broke the record for the largest delegation of women. We were about 104 women. And Antarctica is also special because it's the only continent devoted to peace and science. And that's what this treaty is about. There will be no military bases, there will be no nuclear weapons, but there will be scientific exploration. There will be collaboration. Is a very unique place. And it felt like we traveled through a whole other world, but really we only ventured onto the tip of the peninsula here. So each of these dots, this is what one of my um, friends and colleagues, Emma Kennedy, put together as a story map of where we visited. Each of these dots is where we were able to make a landing on the Antarctic Peninsula. What our days would look like is we'd sit in this big room and you can kind of see these majestic mountains and stuff outside the window. So if you think it's hard concentrating on Zoom, try concentrating when there's that out the window <laughs> that you're trying to be looking at. Uh, so we would, we would have several hours of these uh, kind of lectures and interactive activities where we would do some pretty intensive training. 
And on most days, we were quite lucky with the weather, so we were able to make landings too. We get all kitted up in all of these uh, life jackets and big coats and boots, and we get on these zodiacs, easy little boat through the glacier here, and go out and make landings on the peninsula. I um, wanted to include this picture just to show uh, the network science picture from our friend Brennan Klein. So what did we actually learn? Um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest lessons I want to give to you is about self-awareness. There have been tons and tons of studies into different leaders and what makes a particular, what makes a good leader and they're not finding anything in common. And I like the sentiment in this paper that I reference here. Well, thank goodness they're not finding anything in common. We don't want them all to be the same. And what this review did was interview 125 CEOs and the only thing they found that they had in common was self-awareness. They knew themselves very well, they knew their story very well, and they knew how to use it and how to better themselves. So self-awareness is a big goal here, and it should be all of our goals. And one tool that Homeward Bound gave us to do this is something called the Lifestyles Inventory. And you're looking at this circumplex and there's, that's what it's called, just the circle circumplex. There's the blue area, the red area, and the green area. The blue area is corresponding to ways of thinking that are constructive styles, achievement, self-actualizing, humanistic, affiliative. They're constructive, they're optimal thinking paths for you to be able to get stuff done and be happy. Um, then the, the other two are called defensive styles, um, one passive, one aggressive. The green one is passive, so things like avoiding, dependent, approval, conventional, so if you're seeking approval. Um, these are very stereotypically women-associated characteristics, um, so you might be a bit quiet and afraid to speak up, and this defensive way of thinking is holding you back. The red side's more aggressive, so power-driven, oppositional, competitive, perfectionistic. These are defensive mechanisms that are designed to keep us safe and they hold us back from thinking constructively. So we had to fill out some questionnaires to map out the way we think about ourselves. And we had to ask colleagues to fill in the same things about us. Um, so that's quite terrifying. I mean, who wants to ask this level of detail from your colleagues of what they think about you? Um, but we all went ahead and we did that. We, we have to be brave. And we got our results back, which I'll come to in a moment. And part of the, one, one of the first exercises in Ushuaia before we boarded the ship was to look again at these circumplexes, look again at the questionnaire and say, how would I answer this if I were the ideal leader? If I'm thinking who I would admire, who I would like to lead me, how would they answer this? And we went through and we answered it again. There's a hundred of us in each one of these pictures is from a table of eight or 10 women. And look how they're all the same. Um, everything, we're all coming up with the same story that an ideal leader should be very, very constructive thinking. You get little bits of red and blue. Some of these are cultural, some of, it's just, some of it is healthy. You have to stand up for yourself a little bit on the red side, but too far is detrimental. And it should matter a little bit what your colleagues think of you, but you shouldn't be basing everything on what their viewpoints are. So this is kind of what we converged on of what the ideal leader should be responding. And here's the tragedy. Uh, when they showed us our aggregate data for all of our cohorts, the one on the left is how we answered about ourselves, how we thought about our own minds and our own behaviors. And look how weighed down that is by the blue, by the green and the red. All of these defensive styles showing that we don't feel safe, we feel defensive, we've got all of these mechanisms in place. It's hard work. And then on the right, this is what our colleagues thought of us. They already see the ideal leader and they don't see any of this other stuff that's going on underneath. And I found this an enormous tragedy. Uh, but it is also an opportunity that really what we have to work on here is our own thinking patterns to make ourselves optimal. If we're thinking like this on the left, we're tired and we're not using our energy in constructive places. It is suboptimal and it does not make us happy. So part of this is we are wired to make up narratives. Our brains crave them. We look at everything and we make up stories. Some of these, we carry them from society. Uh, so girls, like girls especially, we're told to be 
you know, good little girls and quiet and polite. And society puts these narratives on you and tells you who you should be. And we carry them into adulthood and we have to start to think about undoing them. We look at things every day that happen in life and we make up stories. We make up stories about the way other people treat us. And we have to now, the challenge is to come back to them and say, which ones of these are actually serving me? Which ones of them are helping me achieve the task I want to achieve, be the person I want to be? And to start looking at that, we need to come with, okay, this is loud, I'll be quiet for a minute. <laughs> we need to come with curiosity. The baby elephant seals were super curious and kept flopping right up to our feet. We couldn't move, we're not allowed to move when an animal is that close. But we need to come with this curiosity and with a generosity of thought without judgment to say what, what is happening, what is really happening, what is the story I'm telling myself. Like, for example, you could be in a meeting at work and someone could speak over you and you'll just be, oh, they're always trying to undermine me. They don't take me seriously. Nobody wants to listen to what I say. My work isn't valued here. Well, is it true? Is it really true that that's happening? You can look back at it and say, well, this person did speak over me and I don't, I think that they think really bad of me. I don't think they trust me to do my job. But is it really true? Is it really true? maybe they didn't notice you speaking, maybe they were looking the other way, maybe they have a different value system to you, so it didn't occur to them to think of these things. And how does it make you feel believing that it's true? It makes me feel not taken seriously, it makes me feel sad, it makes me not want to bother contributing and find the energy to do so. And who would I be if I didn't believe it was true? Well, then I might say, excuse me, I was trying to talk and this is the point I'd like to make or be patient until they're finished and then bring your stuff to the table anyway. It, it invites you to be in a more constructive space. You can approach them and talk about it so it doesn't have again in the, happen again in the future. You have to step up to these stories and take responsibility for not shutting yourself out of the picture just by being defensive when really you can be in a constructive space. Your emotions are usually telling you something, so stop and notice them. Instead of letting them control, just stop and notice. And part of this, part of this understanding narratives and becoming self-aware is to really explore purpose and values. And too often in business and academia too, things are results driven rather than value driven. The results should be at the top of the pyramid. There is a purpose, there is a why, there are values at the bottom of why we do things. These build into actions, which build into results. The results are at the top of the pyramid and too often people focus just on how do we get the results rather than why are we getting them? And one helpful exercise is to ask yourself five times over, why are you doing this? So right now I'm sat in a chair in my office and I'm talking to you, why am I doing this? because I want to attend that Syed. Why do I want to do that? I want to tell you about the experiences I had in Antarctica with Homeward Bound and I want to catch up with you all. Why do I want to do that? Why am I doing it? I want to convince you that compassion and authenticity have a place in leadership and academia. I want to learn from you. I want to connect with you all. Why am I doing this? I want us to do better. I'm quite heartbroken at the state of the world and I think you are too. I want to gain knowledge. I want to gain connection. Why do I want to do this? I want to make a difference. I value wisdom. I think connection is central to existence. And you see how quickly you dig deep down into what really matters to you, what your values are, what the purpose is. And people can get behind a purpose. People will mobilize for purpose and for value. And this is us being able to take part in the school strike for climate. Um, be like as a representative in Antarctica. So on that particular one, there will have been representation on all seven continents. And another thing you can do to explore your values, this is a good exercise to start digging into the kind of things and you'll start to see what comes up for you and what things matter to you. These are just some words that are examples that might come out as values. Adventure is certainly another one of mine. 
um, challenge, wisdom, respect, fun. And you should think about different pillars in your life. There is work, there's family, there's leisure, there's learning. And you can just make a list of all the things that matter to you in these areas. And I keep saying matter to you, this is a personal thing and how to make a great leader. You can also do this in a business context or in a classroom context. What do I want my values to be in my classroom? What do I want the values to be in my business endeavor? And once you made a list of say 10, restrict yourself to three. And these should be so fundamental. I really like the way it was put to us of, if you were given the choice between chopping off your arm and keeping these values, you're gonna chop off your arm and keep the values. They have to be this central to you. Once you have your list of values, you can start interrogating them. What am I doing that is supporting this value? And what am I doing that is undermining it? You can systematically analyze all of your interactions at work and at home and allow yourself to be a bit more deliberate in how you uphold your values. So here's one example. Um, this is just an example of a value of freedom to learn. So one thing that someone might do that's positive for this is to seek regular feedback from people they report to. They might have a coach, but the negative behavior, having so many commitments, they're not able to have the time to learn. Having a manager that's judgmental or one that they feel judgmental for. And throughout life, if we seek continual learning, we will move between four, four stages. Explorers where we, we don't know, we're looking for what our purpose is. And we sh in that phase, you should try many, many different things and expose yourself to them. Artists, where you really, really throw yourself into one of these things, try it out and see how it fits you, try new things. Judges, where you weigh up which things should I really be doing, where shall I commit my time? And warriors, where you march ahead with the things you've learned with a clear purpose. And this is where you should have your tribe around you. You should have at least one person that you can trust that you can come to when you're in doubt and feeling these defensive behaviors. So one important thing to all of this, of course, is psychological safety. Some of these things are very raw to be exploring. And I think in science, there's a tendency for us to sometimes pretend we're not human. We, we are human first, we are scientists second. We need psychological safety. And I want to share with you how this was achieved on the ship. And you could think about bringing these to your own workplaces in your own classrooms. This, uh, I mean, these are all wonderful women and we all had great intentions and big aspirations, but it's still a hundred women in a tiny boat for three weeks. <laughs> That's kind of inviting conflict. How are you gonna make a hundred voices feel equally heard? So before we got on the boat, we did an exercise where all of the 100 people were separated onto tables of about 10. And we had a lot of prompt questions. Some of these questions included, what do we want to get out of the experience? What would I need to help you accomplish it? What are you afraid of? And how can others help you? And when we talked about these questions and laid down our own boundaries, our own needs and our own dreams, we were able to come together with a list of things that and the list of behaviors that would allow us to do these. And as our group norms, and I think it's really worth taking the time to put this kind of thing together in a group with everybody contributing to it, everybody agreeing to it. You now have something to hold you accountable for a type of behavior and working towards the thing that you collectively want to work towards. So some of these things included showing up authentically with curiosity and courage, respecting other people's boundaries, enabling each other's growth and actually listening, acti actively listening, and to hold each other accountable to do the things that we set out to do, to build the connections and to lead for a greater good. And this will look different for different classrooms, different workplaces, but I think you'll find a lot of the same things keep coming up. So to me, what Homeward Bound was, was kind of a giant social experiment where we could ask, what would we do and who would we be if we could believe that everyone we interacted with had 100% good intentions? And let me tell you, it's a really beautiful world. And I really believe and I really hope that we can bring more of this to the workplace. 
academia, we uh, we spend a lot of time complaining that it's toxic, toxic cultures, and poor family life balance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, the thing is, we're part of that workplace. It is our responsibility to stand up and do something different. We can build labs, we can build classrooms, we can build cultures that are not like this, that stand up for values that we believe in. And hey, it turns out they're more effective. It's not just nice, it's not just fun, it's actually more effective. We're seeing it right now, who could have predicted with the pandemic. The leaders that are embodying all of these values that I'm talking about, working for the collective instead of the individual, seeking truth instead of stubbornly arguing you're right, leading by the why, the underneath, the values, the purpose, instead of by force and being authentic. These are the people that are actually having success in controlling the pandemic. And we're seeing the heartbreaking situations in the countries where this is not being modeled. <laughs> so I wanna leave you with this beautiful quote. And, uh, oh, sorry. No, I, I can't leave my video again, so I'm sorry, I can't read all of it. But this, it, this is from Theodore Roosevelt, a man in the arena, very famous quote. But I bring it up specifically because of some work by Brené Brown, and I'll put a link to some of her work in the next slide. If you're going to be this authentic, you're making yourself vulnerable and you're making yourself vis visible. And this is all well and good in a psychologically safe space, but not everywhere is. So you have to really decide whose feedback you're going to listen to. And she argues that the only people that she will listen to feedback from are the people who are also in the arena, the people whose face are marred by dust and sweat and blood, the people who strive valiantly and keep coming short again and again but they keep trying, they keep putting themselves in the arena, then they are people that you can listen to, you can take feedback from. And you need this kind of mentality to survive, say everything that happens on Twitter nowadays. So these are some things that I would really point you to, to dive a bit deeper and take inspiration. Brené Brown is such a leader and a role model in this space. And she's got several books, including Dare to Lead, Rising Strong and Daring Greatly. There's some stuff on Netflix and TED Talks, really encourage her, she's a fantastic speaker. Um, of course, the Homeward Bound website, especially for anyone who wants to apply. And the middle one, What Antarctica Taught Us, this is a project I've been doing with some of the other women from the UK who took part. We've been collecting little stories from all of the women who went to Antarctica and what they learned. So thank you very much. It's been lovely to talk to you about this and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Applause for our speaker. And what a great inspiring way to, to end our, our symposium. Um, and I just wanna make a comment and then I'll see if there's questions um, that it really brings together um, what at, at, at the bottom, what we're all talking what we're all talking about today, um, which is how to use specifically how to use uh, network science and network thinking, but it, in order to better ourselves and our community and our world. And um, this is just a great uh, way to kind of put a, a cap on all of that um, and the possibilities that are uh, really essentially endless if we put our mind to it. So thank you. Um, any questions for Emma or comments? Hiroki, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Emma, for sharing the, uh, your great experience uh, with us. So uh, many people over there, they have some the specialized expertise. You are a network scientist and many others came from different domains. So I was wondering if you had a chance to actually exercise your expertise or maybe do your colleagues did the same to survive in that kind of very interesting environment or maybe other types of the you know sharing experience among the participants did you have such stories to tell yeah a little bit a little bit so it was very very intensive on the leadership aspect so we were doing a lot of self-exploration and learning these leadership tools so it was mostly that rather than using the expertise that we have in our own domains. However, we spent a long time as well having like a whole collaborama session where we put forward the things that 
we're good at, the things we would like to work on. And we've been forming little collaborations in groups together. So um, there was only just a Nature article published by some people with more expertise in marine science and advocating for an Antarctic protected area. And they were able to piece this together by the knowledge they had of specifically Antarctica and marine environments. And then they had the visibility oomph that we were able to give them by collectively signing on it. Um, me as a network scientist, I've been collaborating with uh, about 10 other women. Uh, we are trying to map out the networks of Homeward Bound to tackle problems like, I think there's a huge diversity problem within Homeward Bound. Um, there's, there's quite a skew towards white women, this needs to change. And if we start mapping out networks where people are from geographically, where their skills are, where their demographics are, we can start to question like where is the best place to insert scholarships, where is the best place to bring in more money, uh, sorry, more, more uh, women and expertise. So that's the kind of way I'm hoping to use network science. And ultimately, even if we think about what we want to do as a collective, the kind of big problems we want to take on in the world, the networks of our group would tell us which expertise we have the poises as well to do that. And again, which things are missing because there's another few years of applicants yet. Thank you. Great. Um, any other quick questions or comments for Emma? Okay, well, again, applause for Emma. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful way to wrap up this day and um, I think on behalf of all of the organizers, we just want to say thank you. Um, the talks were fantastic. Um, thanks again to my fellow organizers uh, for pulling this together. As you all know, this was a big experiment for us um, going outside of, the, outside of the main conference, but with their blessing, um, which uh, has really, it's one of the silver linings, I would say, of this pandemic that we're all living in um, is this idea of being able to be much more accessible uh, to, every, to the whole world. And we had attendance from all over the world, which was uh, fantastic, and new voices, and just the comments in the chat. Um, seems that it's been a very positive experience for everybody. And, and again, thank you to uh, all the presenters. Uh, really a fantastic day. Yes. A big round of applause to all of the all of the presenters again, and we will be in touch. We, as we've said a number of times, we're going to be putting uh, the recorded talks up on a YouTube channel. We'll let you all know. We do have all of your emails, and now that now that we do have all of your emails, um, we are going to uh, at least be starting the high school discussion group, maybe some other groups. And as also been mentioned very soon is going to be the call for symposiums for the net, next uh, NETSI. So we'll have to think about uh, how we want to do that one. Uh, so we'll be in touch uh, with you about that. Um, any of the Massimo or Hiroki, Steve and uh, Evelyn, any of the other organizers have any other comments, anything I forgot? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you all again and um, have a great rest of the day, evening, middle of the night, wherever you are. And we will certainly be in touch and um, uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Everybody, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> bye.